I should have a drink for this, but I don't. It's okay. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you're new here. My name is Noelle. The seven is my Enneagram type. And this is a tag challenge video that was created by the bar in the bookcase. And uh, Haley from Haley Fuse, Haley Fuse, Haley from Haley Hughes tagged me in this months ago, maybe in the spring or summer. <laughs> We have a list of uh, classic cocktails and each of them is assigned a prompt to recommend something based on that. Let's, let's do this thing, let's do this thing. You know what that just reminded me of is that TikTok where <laughs> it's the guy that's wearing like eight hats and he just goes, top of the morning, top of the morning, top of the morning, top of the morning. Anyway, the first cocktail on this list is an old fashioned, yes, Old fashioned, recommend a historical fiction. And you know, you know, I can't let the opportunity go by without recommending The Rose Code by Kate Quinn. And first of all, I really feel like I have grown to appreciate historical fiction a lot more in the last year. I really did not think that it was my genre. And this year I have dipped my little toe into the historical fiction world and have continually had my mind blown especially with the Rose Code. This is a World War II historical fiction that follows three different women told from each of their POVs. It's long, it's like six or 700 pages, but it does not feel like it. It takes place in the, a real historical place called Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park was a secret British intelligence base. So no one in their lives even knows that they're literally cracking codes for the war. <laughs> We're gonna be here a while if I just keep gushing about the Rose Code. So here's what we'll say. It's told in two different eras. It's like the, the years during the war and then a few years after the end of the war and it bounces back between the two, between each of their POVs. And um, you start to get the sense that there is this strange mystery because in the after, the later um, time period after the war ends, one of the women is locked away in an asylum and you don't know why, you don't even really know which one it is until a decent chunk of the way through the book. And uh, that slowly is... revealed. <laughs> it's part mystery, part uh, drama, part character study, because all three of the main women could not be more different from each other, but they end up bonding and becoming this like trio of really tight friends even though they each go through very specific and very different traumas over the course of their involvement with Bletchley Park and during the war and in their personal lives. I loved it. I, like, it is unmatched. And because of the Rose Code, I am planning to dive through the rest of Kate Quinn's backlist because it, it left such a mark on me. Next is Sidecar, a book with a strong supporting character. And I think of everything on this list, this was the one that I debated a lot because there are many side characters that I deeply love and admire. And I settled on Red Rising, specifically my girl Mustang. I, I love Mustang. I also love Severo. So <laughs> bonus points for Severo. They are both side characters in this series, but specifically Mustang. I don't know what it is about her, but I think she is so badass. Mustang does exactly what she wants and she is exactly who she wants to be. She does not compromise for anyone. She is so smart and so cunning and she commands respect, but she's also like still kind. Uh, and I, I just, I love her. I think as far as female characters written by men, I, I really like Mustang. <laughs> so that is, <laughs> that is my sidecar for, uh, for this purpose. But just in general, I still haven't finished this trilogy, which is, um, a shame and I'm working on it. But in general, if you haven't read Red Rising, it's basically, um, Hunger Games crossed with Game of Thrones in space. And if that isn't enough to sell you on it, I don't know what is. 
I keep meaning to make my boyfriend read this and it has not happened yet. And I know, I know that it will become his new personality as soon as it happens. Also, yeah, it's, it's signed. I found this at my local used bookstore where I find so many treasures and um, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Pierce just signed a copy of a book that I own. And I think that's pretty neat. The next cocktail is a Manhattan. And the recommendation is a book set in New York. And this was uh, one of the easiest ones on this entire list. And I chose The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin for uh, what feels like obvious reasons. And this book has a lot of mixed reviews. I happened to really, really love it. I actually would love to reread it because there is so much depth that I don't think I absorbed it all as well as I could have the first time. Something I love about N.K. Jemisin is that she doesn't feel the need to hold readers' hands. She just lets them take from the book whatever they want to take from it. But that also means that you have to do more work as the reader to kind of dig in and scoop out the, the meaning of what she's trying to do. And I, I think it's genius because the premise of this book is that each of the boroughs in New York City becomes personified and like chooses an avatar to represent that borough. It like comes alive. And this is, this is very layman's terms. Like there's a lot of deep, uh, like magic and uh, philosophy and history that is explored in here over the course of the long fantasy, urban fantasy novel. But obviously, for something set in New York, I had to choose the one where they, they literally are, in every sense of the word, the characters are New York. And I can't emphasize that enough because that is what clicked for me like two thirds of the way through the book and made me realize how absolutely genius this book actually was. There's a handful of characters in this book that you meet each a little bit at a time and um, as you get to know the character, you realize at the same time, you are also getting to know very intimately that burrow. And it's so cool. It's so cool. It's just such a love letter to New York. I'm pretty sure that N.K. Jemisin like says as much in her acknowledgements. I love reading acknowledgements always. It's one of my most favorite parts of finishing a book. But the end of N.K. Jemisin's acknowledgements says this, I have hated this city. I have loved this city. I will fight for this city until it won't have me anymore. This is my homage to the city. Hope I got it right. Ugh. I, I'm, I, I love it. I love it. It's weird. It's, it takes a while to read because you feel like you're using 200% of your brain. It's, um, it really <laughs> made me work for it, but I loved it. And I'm excited to see what she does next in this world. The next one I had to get a little bit creative. This is Bloody Mary, a book that scared you or messed you up. And I don't read scary books. I don't. I don't like scary movies. I don't like being scared. Um, but there are books that thrill me. There are books that have broken me or messed me up a plenty. So <laughs> what I chose was A Reaper at the Gates by Saba Tahir, which is the third in the An Ember in the Ashes series. This one wrecked my shit so good. <laughs> the entire second half, honestly, the whole thing, because the second book ends on a very heartbreaking cliffhanger. And so this one picks up right where that starts. But the second half of this one especially just continually punches you in the face. If I have not convinced you to read this series or you have just not read it in general, allow me to try again one more time. My favorite books in the series go in reverse series order. It's a four book series. My favorite of the series is A Sky Beyond the Storm, the fourth, then this one, then the second book, then the first book is literally my least favorite in the series and Ember in the Ashes, least favorite in the series. So if you read the first one and you're like, I don't get it, what's the hype? Please, for the love of God, please, for the love of God, keep going, keep going. If, if you finish the second book and you did not feel something, 
you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> um, again, this is the third. I can't elaborate on what broke me so bad, um, but if you know, you know. Hands down, this is my favorite YA fantasy series. And the first book is about Leia and Elias. Leia is one of the scholar people who are oppressed by the martial people. And Elias is a young martial scholar at this military training academy where he is about to graduate. And Leia um, has something happen in her family very early in the first book. And she ends up joining the scholar like resistance, basically like a spy network against the marshals who are trying to like wipe the scholars off the face of the earth. So she ends up as a servant at working at the Marshall Academy, military academy, uh, kind of undercover for the scholar resistance, which is where she meets Elias. And um, at the Marshall Academy, there's a bunch of trials with some of the like senior students at this military academy in order to determine who the next emperor is going to be. There's a lot of history that I'm skipping over, obviously. The first book is more like a golden age YA. There's like a game trial aspect to it. There's like a will they, won't they kind of a romance thing. After the first book, it just like all hell breaks loose. It's the best, it's the best. And um, when you get to book three, just make sure you have plenty of tissues, maybe book a therapy appointment. You've been warned. Okay, <laughs> the, ne the next one is Espresso Martini, a book that kept you reading into the night. For this one, I went with The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner because I read this almost a year ago as an arc before it came out. So I didn't know any of the hype about it. I wasn't sure if it was gonna be a big book or what. I was like completely un phased by any anyone else's thoughts about it. And I remember reading it um, on my Kindle as an arc, just like having my mind blown. And okay, one more chapter. Okay, wait, what happens next? One more chapter. And suddenly it would be like three in the morning and I would have to force myself to set my Kindle down. Um, I loved it. It's kind of a quiet mystery that slowly ramps up the pace and it's told in two timelines, one in the present day and one uh, in a more historical time, like two or 300 years before present time. And our main character in the present is on a, um, like not a honeymoon, but an anniversary trip where she's trying to come to terms with a lot of things in her personal life. And she stumbles across this like mystery glass bottle that sends her down this uh, kind of path of research and uh, exploring the city and it feels like, where is this going? Meanwhile, in the chapters that take place in the past, there's this other mystery taking place where we follow um, Nella, who is not a witch per se, but she runs an apothecary, which is known underground by women in the town where you can go and have Nella make you a poison. I'm losing my light. This is, this is a problem. It's fine. We're, we're halfway done. Um, so Nella will make these women poisons like discreetly that are easily disguised in food or tea or whatever so that they can kill the men in their lives, causing them pain or anguish. It's not fantasy. Like I keep seeing it marketed as fantasy. The cover looks very fantasy. This is historical fiction. This is historical fiction with a twist, with just a sprinkle, a tiny little, little sprinkle of magical realism at, at best, which I still think is generous. I mostly just think this is very creative historical fiction. It kept me up really late. I loved how it ended. I love where we went. I loved it so much that I bought a physical copy. So yay. The next cocktail is a Sazerac and the prompt is a book that left you disoriented. And um, this is the second N.K. Jemisin book of this video, which is the fifth season. And if you know what I'm talking about, I don't need any explanation. But if you don't know about the fifth season or you haven't read it, um, I don't really wanna tell you anything because the fun of this book 
is discovering for yourself. It's genius. It's simply genius. It won the Hugo Award, as did the second and third books in the series, back-to-back -back years. Like, that's that is so incredible. The the very general premise or maybe like the world premise of the fifth season is there's these seasons where some humongous like a game-changing natural disaster will occur and uh, they've they kind of talk about over the course of the book like what some of the past seasons have been uh, and you discover what this fifth season is. It's told in three POVs. It's adventurous, it's mysterious, it's fantastical with a sprinkle of science. It unfolds that in a way that just keeps you guessing and thinks you've got it figured out and then keeps you guessing and has so many like thinly veiled commentaries on a lot of like real world, like our world circumstances really makes you think. I loved it and definitely when I finished it I just, it was one where you, you finish it and you stare at the wall for a while. Just wondering like, what just happened to me? What did I just read? Damn this time change, I can't believe that I don't have any light left. We're gonna speed through the rest of this video. <laughs> the next one um, is getting back on my soapbox a little bit. This is a Long Island iced tea, which is, the prompt is, a book that is doing too much, bonus points if it works anyway. And originally I had planned to do a different book for this, but I switched it up because No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood was shortlisted for the Booker Prize this year. And when the winner was announced, it wasn't this book, which is fine. Like it didn't need to win. But after the winner of the shortlist was announced, I started seeing a lot of people ragging on this book. This is one of the best books I've read this year. It's, it's so tiny. It's like a five hour audiobook, And I still think about it all the time. It's 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 really weird. It's very strange. It feels like you're reading a bunch of tweets and that's kind of the point. It follows this unnamed protagonist. We never learn their name and the first half is all about her involvement and presence in the online world which is always referred to as the portal. So she's always deep in the portal. She's kind of internet famous. She travels around the world at like speaking engagements and talking about, kind of talking about the internet, talking about the portal. And it feels very surface level and also very deep at the same time, because that's kind of what the internet is. <laughs> and then very abruptly, halfway through the book, she receives some news from her family that something is going on in her actual real life with her real family when um, her sister becomes pregnant and big content warnings for um, complications during pregnancy, complications after childbirth. So now our protagonist is kind of pulled back to earth, so to speak, and it feels really disorienting because she feels so helpless and she feels so isolated while also exploring wow, I finally feel present. I finally feel love and gratitude and perspective and appreciation, but I also feel this profound loneliness and grief and um, confusion about the world and how the internet has brought us all together, but it's also so sensationalized and so surface level. It's, I, I loved it and I think about it so often that I, this book does not deserve uh, <laughs> the the hate that it's getting right now. And so admittedly, yes, it's it's doing a lot. And of the books that I have read that I feel like, wow, this is really doing a lot, this actually does them well. And somehow it does it in like the size of a novella. If you like weird books that, that pack a big punch and it's not gonna bother you how weird it is, like, give it a try. Strongly recommend. Then we have a Negroni, which is a book with a love triangle. And I'm I'm bringing back a classic, a classic um, OG golden YA, which is The Kiss of Deception um, by Mary Pearson. And mostly because this is the only love triangle that I remember actively enjoying and like thoroughly enjoying, not just tolerating, because God knows there's a lot of love triangles in like a golden age YA that we just tolerated, okay? 
But this one, like this book would not have been as good if it did not have the love triangle. So let me explain. This is <laughs> a, a young princess in an arranged marriage that she doesn't want to be in. So she runs away from the palace and disguises herself as like a peasant girl in a small seaside town. That's how cliche YA we're talking and I love it for it. Eventually, uh, these two handsome strangers also show up in the little town where she has settled and carved out a happy little life for herself. Uh, she just thinks that these two young men are two mysterious hotties that she now gets to ogle in her little town. But you as the reader know that one of them is the prince or whoever that she was supposed to marry and the other is an assassin, but you don't know which is which. And she doesn't know anything. She just thinks they're like two random cuties that showed up. <sighs> I want to reread this so bad. It's been so long, probably like eight years since I read this. This really took me for a ride and I probably would be able to figure out who was who if I reread it now. But when I read it the first time I was on, I was just along for the ride and I felt like I guessed who was who and I didn't. And then I would second guess myself and then I thought I had it figured out and I loved it. I loved it. I want to reread it. I want to finish the series because now I know there's a spin-off series that I think is even more highly acclaimed. Maybe because I, I almost want to say that one's new adult. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. But yeah, this is, this is my love triangle of choice. Anytime love triangles come up, I always think of this book because I, I genuinely had so much fun and I'm a person who usually just, just hates them and avoids them at all cost. But I loved this. So the next cocktail is Bay Breeze, a book with light, chill, heartwarming vibes. And I have chosen Payback's a Witch for this one because I feel like I need to defend myself. I am filming this video after I filmed my um, like October, September wrap up. And also after I found out that a lot of my friends hated this. <laughs> Um, this was a five star rate for me and I feel like I never rate romance five stars and I almost think it's because it didn't even really feel like a romance to me. This really felt like more of a character study but it was very chill, it was very casual, but there was a lot of meaning there if you wanted to read like down into it with like the main characters. It's also sapphic, there's real magic. It felt very like like Hollywood witches um, without it being like like cheesy or gratuitous. Like there's simply the small town where witches are real and their and magic is real and there's this magical competition to determine who becomes like the next magical mayor of the town basically. And um, I, I really liked it. it. It made me happy and I loved the sapphic romance, even with no spice. And if you didn't like it, that's okay. But I just felt like I needed to say once again that I'm obsessed. Only two left. We have Dark and Stormy, a book that is dark, thrilling, and menacing. Bonus points if the setting matches. And for this, I chose The Radium Girls by Kate Moore, which this is a nonfiction, but it reads like a thriller. So don't be, don't be turned off just because it's nonfiction, especially if you love thrillers and you want to get into nonfiction, I would say pick this right up, my friend. Like, what are you waiting for? This is the very dark story of what happens a few years after the discovery of radium in the years of the First World War where young women are uh, working in these factories to paint with radium dust onto like clock dials for military machinery, etc., so that they glow in the dark. All, all you really need to know is that countless young women during World War I were very intimately working with radioactive paint and like ingesting it into their bodies. And when they started to have health effects, mysteriously out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, their, their doctors were like, oh, we don't know what could be causing this. This is, this is so strange. And eventually when they try to talk to these companies that are having them paint all of the dials and the equipment with radium paint, um, the companies take no accountability and like 
put blame onto the women about how, oh, well, you should never have been ingesting it. It's a very, very dark, very sad story. It makes you very angry, very angry, but also so expertly told considering it is all true. It's very well researched. This instantly came to my mind when I read this prompt. And uh, this was a fantastic read and something that I would not have really even known about had I not read this. Okay, okay, we made it to the last one. The last cocktail is a martini, give it classic recommendation. And I, I don't feel like I've read an abundance of classics, but a classic that I do love with my whole heart is 1984. And one, to this day, one of my favorite pieces of academic writing was this uh, long essay I did analyzing the essence of reality through the lens of 1984 and whether there can be more than one reality or there can be multiple and how reality is manipulated and what that can do to a person's psyche. But I'm also a humongous dork and conversations like that both terrify me and fascinate me. So 1984, I, re I really love. I have a, a strange Orwellian fascination with, with all of those kinds of themes, I even in today's fiction, as probably even just this book stack demonstrated slightly. <laughs> but that is all I have for this little challenge. I actually had a blast. Usually after I f I've filmed a couple videos today and after I sit down and film for a while, I feel usually very tired, but I, I feel like I could go like run a 5K right now. I'm, I'm kind of hyped. I'm gonna tag some people just because I had so much fun, but don't feel like you need to do this uh, if you don't like, if you're not a tag person or you've already done it, whatever. But I think it would be really fun to see some of my friends do this. So I will tag Jan Agaton, uh, Laura's Library Card, Sid Bookworm, <laughs> and also Naomi and Christina and Monique. So if you needed permission or a reason to uh, do this little tag, consider, consider this a permission slip, my friends. And also for anyone else that just thinks this would be fun to do, like of course, hi, obviously you can make this video if you want to make this video. <laughs> Please let me know what you thought of these books. Have you read any of these books? Do you agree with matching them up to these prompts or would you have chosen something different? Like, I would love to know. Please let me know your thoughts. And of course, as always, feel free to come say hello over on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, but mostly Instagram is where I'm most active outside of YouTube. We have a great time. I love my Instagram stories. I'm there all the time. Thank you so much for watching my friends. I hope you are well and I will see you very soon. <laughs> love you, bye.